You're watching Leafs Morning Tape with host Nick Alberga and former NHLer Jay Rosehill. The show starts now. Presented by Botano, it's time for the Monday edition of Leafs Morning Take. Nick Alberga and Carter Hutt with you to break down another busy, busy weekend for the Maple Leafs. What's going on? Uh, not much, buddy. And during, uh, we got hit with the snow. I know you guys got it. So it was a crazy day in the Hutton household, getting everybody off to school. I'm glad the schools weren't canceled because uh, I don't want to have to look after my kids, Nikki. Man, the weather is so bipolar. And I hear you on that front where it's like a week and a half ago, I was getting ice cream. It was like 20 degrees wearing shorts. And the next thing you know, there's like a full on blizzard on Thursday and Friday. Like, I don't know what's going on. I'm not sure if it's the same out in Thunder Bay, but I hate this time of year just because you're teased. You're teased with the spring and summer, and then they, you're reminded it's still technically sort of winter slash spring. I don't know what it is right now. I know. I feel like it gets your hopes up, right? You start seeing grass and things. We've had mild winter for sure, and then all of a sudden it hits, and you realize that it's still hockey season. You know, it, it comes at you hard and fast here. But, no, it's been good, honestly. Uh, a big weekend, obviously, getting back-to-back games here. Yeah, man, I was bored. I know a lot of people in the chat are going to react. I shaved my head. I don't know. I like to try new shit, different shit. Uh, you know, I've been pondering a trip to Turkey to get a hair transplant or something. It just have to do something, man. Just, you know, as the years go by. Uh, but it was I, I also was thinking about like a different juju. If you can believe it, the last time, I guess, or the second last time the Leafs escaped the first round because they won one last year. I had a buzz cut, so I was like, hey, uh, I'm going to give myself more belief as we head into the Stanley Cup playoffs. Man, I can't believe we're less than a month away from this thing because we talk about that a lot on this show, how the entire year is just preparation for the Stanley Cup playoffs. Man, we're almost there. It's exciting. Yeah, it's. I find it easier now being on the other side of you know doing media and being involved in it where at times early in the season we're talking about stuff and part of me is like, who cares, right? Like there's so many games and I get their storylines and I get that's the side I'm on now where even when I was playing at times where you lose a game early in the season, you'd be like, oh, whatever. We got another 70 to make it up where now you're, now it's time. Now it's crunch time. Now it's like things have kind of lined themselves into place. You know, who's playing well? What are the lines? Who's going to be in net? You know, who's going to get the matchup? So we're getting to the juicy part of the season, Nick, and I'm couldn't be more excited. So they had two sets of back-to-back last week. Um, Generally speaking, would would a coaching staff or a team be pleased or happy or feeling positive after splitting like both sets, right? They had Tuesday, Wednesday, Philadelphia, Washington, then over the weekend, Edmonton and Carolina. Would you feel optimistic, positive, acceptant of what happened? Yeah, I think all things considered, you know, you'd be pretty happy with the way it went, right? I, I feel like they played a great game at home Saturday night and a huge cool. matchup against the Edmonton Oilers, right? And then to go down to Carolina the next night is a tough game. It's a really tough game. And, you know, to get the outcome, obviously not to get the game, but it wasn't like they didn't play well. You know, it was, again, I know you kind of tweeted it out there or, or X'd it out there. I don't know how you say it anymore, but about yeah. a moral victory. But it is one of those games where it's like you're not going to see back-to-backs in the playoffs. Where, But that's a, that was a good game. It's a tough game. And all things considered, I would consider it a pretty good weekend and a week in general. It's crazy, man. I felt better about the Leafs losing that game than I did the way they closed out the Edmonton game. I was watching that. Maybe it was a couple drinks I was throwing around on Saturday night. But I'm like, fuck, man. Like, my heart was racing way too much for a 5 nothing hockey game. And it's like... Every team does it, but the least specifically. And again, I've been there for so many deflating losses and weird things in that building and with that team that it's like it didn't shock me at all that Edmonton was a post away from that being a one goal game when it was signed, sealed and delivered. Then Samsonov goes down, which we'll talk about. But just like another day, another weekend in Leafs Nation as we get closer and closer to the Stanley Cup playoffs. I think the projected start date, either the 19th or the 20th of April and certainly looking forward to that. Um, at the Leafs Nation 401, where you can subscribe, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, Leafs Morning Take, wherever you find your podcast as well. Make sure to leave us a five-star review, uh, maybe leave a comment on what you like so much about this podcast. It would be greatly appreciated. So again, at the Leafs Nation 401, if you're watching right now, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button. As men, we're approaching 8,000 subscribers. Pretty crazy. Nice, nice. That's uh, I've had more than that boomy, so that's good. That's a good start, and uh, I feel like it's growing, right? It's good stuff. Even for me now, being involved in this, obviously just as a co-host, right, my starts are sporadic with Jay and his schedule, and 
but I, I find myself more involved to listen and be involved and see what you guys are saying and be on the pulse and you guys bring it to it. You know, I think you do a great job of analyzing this team and the league. So I'm proud of what you guys have done and I'm happy to be part of it, Nikki. Dude, thank you for the words. But, you know, obviously my big thing in year two of this podcast, I just needed some support when, when Rosie couldn't do the show. You know, I was doing a lot of the shows last year by myself and I'm like, who better than A. Carter Hutton, the fastest rising star in professional broadcasting, the podcast world right now. <laughs> But number two, somebody who has the experience being thrust into the fucking fire. We're going to talk about Martin Jones, but hey, that was your career pretty much outside of Buffalo, right? It was too. I actually had this conversation with my dad the other day because my mom, when I played, I was 10 years into my NHL career, contracts, money, I was set, right? And my mom still couldn't watch me play. She still was nervous and still hated the fact when I got in there. And you think of Martin Jones getting thrown in there and the different situation I've been in. And my old man actually talked about that the other day was... Rene got hurt my first full season in the NHL. He had a staff infection, had to get hip surgery. You know, it was a, it was a big deal. And I got thrust in there. And that was a time where I was seven and seven on the year. I wasn't playing great. Wasn't, I ended up having a really great run. And that was like a fragile moment in my career. And, and that's what I ended up being for a lot of years was someone would get hurt. And it's like, hey, Hutz, this is your chance. And I hadn't played. You had to be ready. And that's just because nobody cares about, you know, what you've dealt with or you haven't played. You're not in a rhythm. You're, you're the backup. Get in there. Do your job. Dude, it's difficult, and uh, I commend Martin Jones. I haven't seen the guy in an NHL crease in, like, months, and to come in there against the hottest team in the NHL dating back to November and doing that, really, really impressed, really, really pleased. And, I, in fact, I would throw him a bone. I would throw him a start, a couple starts down the stretch. I think the key now, keep your goalies healthy and fresh for the Stanley Cup playoffs. Brought to you by DoorDash. It's time for the appetizer. For a limited time, our listeners can get 25% off. Up to $10 in value and zero delivery fees in their first order of $15 or more. When you download the DoorDash app, enter code NATION25. That's code NATION25, all in uppercase, 25% off your first order with DoorDash. Offer valid in Canada, subject to change. Terms apply. So I think we're going to go in chronological order. I know there's the back-to-back. -back. We'll start with the Carolina game, then we'll give our thoughts on the Edmonton game. So the Carolina game... I thought for the most part, as mentioned, outside of the first, what, 13 minutes of that game, including the first shift of the game where Carolina scores, I thought for that being the second half of a back-to-back -back and a very difficult building to win in, I thought the, I thought the Leafs played really, really well. I, I think Freddie Anderson was a great story in that, but they later in the game, especially in the second half, Huts, I thought they came in waves. Like I've been mentioning for a while, when the Leafs have depth and they can open up their lineup a bit and roll all four lines, I think they're a scary team. And and to me, that's the, the the bigger story in the last two months, we'll say, is like the depth scoring has really taken off. No, I agree. And it's something that's always been worrisome, right? You talk about the bottom six and you talk about getting some depth scoring where we know the guys, the big dogs are going to produce. And they've, and they've done that in the playoffs. You look at Matthews last year in that Tampa series. Nylander has years of being productive in the playoffs. So for me, it's the fact that it was always the question mark about Domi you know, about Bertuzzi. And then it's been really nice to see Bobby McMahon. You know, he's had a lot of success. And for me... That's a tough game. I like how both goalies played. I think Anderson was really good, which is reassuring for Carolina, the way their cold pending situation has sure. been all year. And Joseph Wall was great. I thought he made some key saves at key times, breakaways. And I, I can't really give him crap on either goal, right? It's a bad turnover. You know, obviously a sloppy play. I think McCabe would want that play back. The only thing I see at times is it gets a little chaotic in the D zone on those turnovers. When the Leafs have structure and they're okay to play in their position, then all of a sudden there's a bad turnover and it's chaos where I'm not going to criticize Austin Matthews because he scores so much, but it's a flyby screen on wall. It makes his life so much harder. And when a guy is shooting from distance, you're almost better off just to let him see it. Like he's not going to get scored on from out there. Trying to half fast block it with two guys. It just creates chaos. And then obviously the tip in. So I liked what I saw last night from a team on a back-to-back, -back, you know, tired. They performed well, which is reassuring because those are the games they're going to be in. They're going to be in games that are hard-fought, tight games, good goaltending because that's playoff hockey and that's what's going to take to win. Yeah, again, that was my major takeaway. Like, I know people want to use the cliche and say it was a scheduled loss. Like, that was going to be a tough game. I had it circled as a tough one. I think the bigger story was obviously the way they played against the Edmonton Oilers. But the big thing for me is, like, Joseph Wall and his resiliency. And this is so difficult for any goalie, never mind a young one who's relatively green at the NHL level, is his response after going down 2 nothing. man. He did not surrender the third goal. And it gave the Maple Leafs a fighting shot. And I thought the second period they were good. And the third period they were good. They got the goal from Robertson. 
And if you can be in a game like that where you're probably thoroughly outplayed and the opposition's giving it to you a bit and to get the net mining they did and to be one shot away from tying that game, if you're Sheldon Keefe, you can't ask for much more, can you? No, you can't. And, uh, you know, just to hang around, right? Uh, you know, something mm-hmm. I learned on my career where sometimes it wasn't going your way or you could tell the team couldn't score, but you can't control that as a goalie. You can only control what you can do. Whether you get 40 shots or you get 20, whatever comes at you, is all you can do and, and control the game. And for me, it's the timely save, right? It's the one where, you know, the McCabe one goes in, it's two nothing. It could have been, that could have folded the tent, right? Back to back, we're going to lose, shut the mill. But they stuck with it because those are the games they're going to have to get play, play in. And I, I think this was a great opponent for a back to back because there's a measuring stick there. This is like a team you want to play against that has structure, that is built for the playoffs, where you're the Leafs, you want to be in that category. You want to be considered one of those teams you don't want to play in the playoffs. And I think they did a great job of that last night. It makes no sense this season in general. It's been such a roller coaster. They can beat like all the elite powerhouses in the Western Conference, but they struggle against Eastern Conference teams and playoff teams in the Eastern. Con- like it's it's so weird to me, but it may, it's the ups and downs, the ebbs and flows of a regular season. And I, again, I, I'm not Mister like, you know, moral victory guy. And I said this as you mentioned on social media, but again, I had I had no problems with it. Um, what did you make of Joseph Wall? Uh, they they flew him in like a day early. Like I could only wonder what he was doing on Saturday night in Raleigh. Obviously, the guy's a professional. He was sitting in his hotel room getting set, probably watching the game and rocking back and forth. But I thought it was a unique wrinkle to this one too. I honestly, I I understand the move. I don't love it because you get a bit detached from the team. The only time I've seen it done was we were playing to get in the playoffs um, when I was in St. Louis. We had the last spot. It came down to the last game of the year against Colorado. So I started the night before in Chicago we played the Hawks we beat the Hawks Jake had flown out the day before to Colorado to get there and just conversing with him because he was the one going through it he didn't like the fact that he was isolated by himself like your whole life you're with your team you're part of the game and then all of a sudden you're just away from it I I I think he's a pro enough to stay with the team but it obviously worked out he played very well and this could be a wrinkle you start to see a bit more now as we carry three guys and we see the fact of you know, there's going to be more goalies in the rotation, especially after this year where the league's gone through so many goalies and so many different situations. And so many teams have used that third goalie depth to add value to their team. So I don't necessarily love it as a goalie. Like, I feel like you're like isolated. And for me, I'd be like, the hell am I going to do? I'm sitting here by myself. I just lost all my buddies that I go to dinner with, that I hang out with. But, you know, obviously he's a pro. And it's the same thing, I guess, when you're at home, you're hanging out on your own for the most part. But he did a great job of... uh you know, answering the bell. And I think the Leafs look pretty smart right now with the way you play. Huts, would you be flying in economy for that? Or would they put you in in, in preferred seating, we'll say, first class? I, I'd, I'd assume you'd be in first class. That would have to be something in the union. Uh, I don't think. <laughs> yeah, that's a tough one because you're sitting on the plane. And like when we fly during the season, the bus literally like brings you up. Or if you're driving to the airport, you walk right on the plane. Like there's no security. This is like you know, the cat's meow, right? Like it's, it's awesome. But at the same time, now all of a sudden you got to sit in security, you got to deal with all these other stuff. So I'm sure that's what he did, but you know, he's a pro and, and a young kid like that. At times I hear Joseph Wall talk and I'm like, he's mature beyond his years. Like he seems so experienced, so calm. And I think it shows in his demeanor, the way he carries himself on the rink, where even those games where, where he lost two to Boston that week, I didn't think he was great. But he's never like horrible. He's never like when Samsonoff was bad, it was like, oh my God, this is a train wreck. Similar to me, like when I was bad, I was like Samsonoff. I was swimming all over the map, trying to do too much. Where Joseph Wall's demeanor is so calm, so good. So I just love his upside. And I, I just think moving forward, he's going to be the guy of the future. Man, only in Toronto would you get pictured at the gate because you're going a day early to the destination of where your team's playing. And they showed pictures on the broadcast of Joseph Wall sitting at the gate with his uh, AirPods in on his computer, just getting set to fly to Raleigh. But again, I, I guess that comes with the... Uh, you know, the territory of being a Toronto Maple Leaf. But again, I'm always very cautious and careful and you don't want to compare guys to like the greats, but like you see a lot of carry price, at least in the demeanor, like you're the goalie you've played in this league. The more and more I watch Joseph wall, like nothing phases this guy. And like, that's the biggest compliment because it's such a difficult position where you sort of have to park the previous goal and the previous shot and look forward to the future all the time. 
Yeah, something I, I feel like reflecting on my career, if there's like, you know, things I could have did better or things I could have got exposed to earlier, I think sports psych would have been one of them. Like I grew up blue collar, Thunder Bay, Ontario. We're tough. We drink beer. We play hockey. We don't care, right? Where as I got a little more mature in my age and career, I was like, this is another asset to have. This is just like me going to the gym or being on the rink, strengthening my game. I'm strengthening my mind. And these younger kids now, it's ex they get exposed to it earlier and, and you can see he already has that skill set to you know control what he can and and be in the moment and and understand that even when he's reflecting to media and talking about a tough game he just seems ice cold and and it's awesome I, and I, and I love that he obviously has a good system in place for good games bad games and he's the perfect goalie in my mind to develop in this system and in this market where there is a lot of pressure right like I broke in you know my full-time gig in Nashville where people didn't care necessarily. Like they were excited because they were going to go get drunk at the game and the Preds win, the Preds lose. No big deal. Like when I went to the airport, no one was taking photos of me. We went out to the bar. We had tons of fun. We did stuff, but these guys are under a different microscope. And I think having that skill set and that awareness at a younger age to grow into it is a huge skill set to have for Joseph Wall. Yeah. And it's even funny. Like I had a lot of people message me, Hey, the Leafs are out for St. Patrick's day. I'm like, well, congratulations to them. Like they're human beings. If they want to go to a bar on King West, they go to a bar on King West. Like just leave them alone and let them do their thing. And if Austin Matthews is in bottle service, Austin Matthews is in bottle service. But again, it's a different lens, different microscope. We get set for the Stanley cup playoffs. Again, we are approaching 8,000 subscribers on this podcast. So help us out. If you're watching right now and not a subscriber, please help us out at the Leafs nation 401. hit that like button as well. It really was the good, the bad, the ugly from Nick Robertson all weekend long. Wasn't crazy about his game, specifically on Sunday in, in Carolina. Just some weird, weird plays. That high sticking penalty I thought was so dumb. The giveaways, like those decisions uh, will hurt his chances of cracking the game one roster, we'll say. But then he hits you with the good stuff and he scores a goal. And then you realize like why it's difficult to take this guy out of the lineup. Yeah, he just has a knack for a net. I remember practicing with him and playing with him a little bit when I was kind of black acing with the Marlies and the Leafs. And he's a good goal scorer. He, trust me, I, I've seen a lot of guys and the way he is deceptive with his shot. And even last night, the quick play, the recognition of like yeah. Matthews is going to get the puck and he gets his feet around quick so he can release it on the fly, almost drifting backwards in a sense, is a great play, is a high quality play. But for me, it's what you touched on earlier is the other side of the puck, the simple things, which is a killer for Robertson. And this has been, this is like a coach killer for me is the <laughs> fact that, you know, yeah. he produces and everybody wants it from him. But then like you see the other side of the puck where I don't have trust putting you over the boards, where there's other players that go over the wall. You know what they're going to bring. They're going to be defensive. They're going to do the right things. Cause we have Nylander, we have Matthews, we have, you know, Marner, these guys that are the offensively top six gifted players where if you're not going to defend the puck well and be predictable, it's hard for a coach to have trust in you, especially when you're trying to build toward the playoffs. So for me, it's I know what he comes with, but that it comes at a cost. And I think that's where his game is lacking. Dare I say you're like me and you're OK. Like if you had to gamble and say, hey, we're going to let go of this guy, we're going to trade him. Would you be OK with that in the, in the summer? hundred percent. I think you have the horses, right? Unless there's a fact where it's like, he, you think he's ready to step up into one of those top roles. What is yeah. the point of playing him in a role where you need defense? Do you need those bottom six? I understand the fact of like, there is the commodity of, if you have a bottom six guy like that, that can still score, but I don't think it could come at a cost of sacrificing defense because those bottom six guys have to defend well. And year after year, the playoffs teach us that if your bottom six can't defend, and a little surplus of scoring, defense has to come first and it kills you. Yeah, that's exactly it. I just don't think he's consistent enough to play in the top six and he's got he's not good enough defensively to play in the third line and why the hell would you play him on the fourth line? So he's caught in limbo and there's always that risk and you can say with every young player, especially a guy like Nick Robertson, as glorified as he is in this market because of the market, he can go somewhere else and rip it up and I would just be like, congrats, unless he turns into Zach Hyman and scores 50 goals then we have a bigger fucking problem. But it's happened so many times where players will leave teams and they'll find their footing, even to an extent lately. Like, I don't know if you've seen Alex Nylander in Columbus. Suddenly, you know, he gets traded for Emil, Emil Bemstrom before the deadline, Pittsburgh and Columbus. And now he's on the top line. He's getting opportunity. Um, granted, like I want to see a larger sample size, but I think I'm at a point. Like, I've seen enough out of Nick Robertson. I think he's approaching the 82-game regular season threshold where it's like, if they have to move on, it's okay. I can brace for the worst on that front. I just think we know what the player is right now, at least. 
No, and there there is always the fact of like a change of scenery sometimes can benefit guys. You know, you look at uh, a good friend of mine, Sam Reinhardt, obviously scoring 50. Uh, but like it wasn't, he wasn't not a player on other teams. And you see Nylander, you see lots of different players that have success just changing where they are. Sometimes it's the comfort of being in that Toronto market is a lot too. And, or getting an opportunity. Sometimes you go to a team where there's lots of depth, right? Like I would always talk about that with my friends when I played. Like, granted, there was 31 teams, now we have 32. But, like, the fact that there's only this many jobs is goaltending. Like, so when I would deal with free agency, just to get a chance to play a little more or get my foot in the door. Or, mm -hmm. or if you're on a team like, say, Tampa and you're drafted and you're a star, or Toronto's a great example with Matthews, all these guys, they already have their high-end talent. So if you're drafted in that role, you might be better suited to be on the Columbuses or be on the teams that aren't as weak because you're going to play more into your role. So... I agree with you here. I feel like it's not like he hasn't got opportunity. It's not like this has just been a little one and done. He's had ample chances to improve his game. And it's something that isn't um, fallen by the wayside by any means. He's been exposed to it. He had lots of time in the American League to fine tune it. And it seems like you just keep going back to the same problem over and over again with him. You know, you know what team I think that could really benefit from like taking a flyer on a Robertson is like a Chicago, right? Like they're not going to be good next year. I think there's the opportunity to play with Connor Bedard. I mean, that's a team I think would take a flyer like San Jose, like a team like that. But I, I think the writing's on the wall. Like there's been so many stops and starts. And again, it, it really is a polarizing conversation in this market. But then you're like, you're reminded a lot, like what he can do and what he can't do. And he's very, very limited and he's not producing and not scoring. He just doesn't really give the team much. And then you see some of the giveaways and like you do that in a playoff game that couldn't just cost you a game and cost you a season. And I just don't have a lot of belief long-term right now in Nick Robertson, at least in a prolific role for this team in the Stanley cup playoffs. Speaking of which uh, TJ Brody makes his return minus one seventeen Oh six. I think Sheldon Keith's famous line. He was just fine, which obviously is such a ringing endorsement to get from your head coach. This team does not feel good about Brody. It goes without saying, but they also realize if they're going to do any and make any noise in the postseason, Brody needs to be Brody of a couple of years back. But the clock is ticking, man, and I just don't see an outcome where it favors the Maple Leafs. No, I agree. His game has just gone by the wayside. And it's tough to see. And you know what's also tough is Sheldon Keefe's interviews after games. Like, at that point, like, <laughs> I, like, is he turning into Tortorella? Like, just don't even answer the he question. Is. Don't even come out then. Like, like what was that like, the other night even... about Samsonov? We're going to get to that. But, like... Like, oh, what do you mean he's fine? The I, I guy left the game yeah. like he got fucking shot. He leaves the game. So, obviously, he's bad enough to leave the game. Now, all of a sudden, he's fine. It's like they said that about Mitch Marner. Now, he's missed three weeks, you know? Yeah. No, it's tough. I find – I know there's things that you keep close to your chest. But like, sure, it's a business in the sense of, like, like at least just show the respect for the guys doing their job, too, as well, right? So, Torts, <laughs> I struggle with a lot because, like, as soon as he gets fired, he goes and works at ESPN or he gets on air. And <laughs> there's a few people I heard make that. And I love it because it's just, like – and then he treats everyone like shit to the media. It's like, well, what are you doing, man? Like, you can't do both, right? So I, I get that feel with Sheldon Keefe. I feel like it's the president of the United States job, right? Like, when you get the job, you're, like, looking good. And by the end, you look like shit. And, but for him, like, for Brody, I get it, right? It's one of those things that he leaves a lot to, like, I know it's been a tough year, but I just, his game, there's just so many holes in his game. And it's so sloppy where we see, like, these other defensemen that come out that aren't as flashy, even when they're on their game, right? We talk about Labushkin and Edmondson and Benoit, like they're just more predictable defensemen where Brody, like his mistakes are so glaring and it's so tough and it creates chaos where I just don't know if he's going to get to that game without any sort of like hiccup in between or like an off season or whatever happens, because it seems like the games just keep piling up and he just keeps being the exact same player that, you know, he hasn't been. Yeah, just zero confidence. And again, we, we've talked about this almost ad nauseum on this podcast where it's like, you know, it was a perfect example. I was watching Saturday's game with a couple of buddies, which I rarely do, having a couple of drinks. And, you know, we, we were shooting Joel Edmondson's name around there. I said, watch out for this guy. Like, this is your prototypical guy in the playoffs. And they're like, you don't even notice him. I'm like, that's the best part about it. We said that about TJ Brody for like 10 years, specifically in Calgary. When you start to notice these guys, it's a bigger issue. Obviously, Edmondson was noticed for the right reasons on Saturday. But yeah, th th this is a unique and fascinating story. And my concern is that they're going to continue to resort back to the resume and the track record. And in the playoffs, it's going to be Brody playing ahead of a Benoit. I, I, 
again, I have no clue why Benoit continues to sit in the press box. My only belief, the thing I want to believe, is that they want to keep this guy fresh for the postseason and it's load management. But I don't think that's the case. Like, I think, you know, as we've said on this podcast the last couple of weeks, it's because of Simone Benoit has been known as a depth defenseman his entire career that he's been slotted in that role where it's like, no, he's the number two defenseman on this team now, man. Yeah, he's taking a step forward, right? Where this is a thing with professional sports that as a player who was never like the star by any means, like I had years where I was the starter and I played, but I was never just like elite guys. Contracts and status and stuff have so much power. It's almost frustrating to a point where, okay, He's got the contract. He's supposed to be the guy. He's not the guy. He hasn't got it done consistently. You have a guy who's getting it done. Play him. Because I've had years where as a goalie, I was out playing the guy. Where mm -hmm. he'd be like, he needs to play because we need to get him going. Right? So it's like, okay, well, so he's playing the shits. I'm playing better than him. But we need to get him going. Or the fact of he's playing so well, we have to keep him going. So it's like, there's really no way for me to improve or to get the crease. Same thing with Benoit. It's like, well, he's playing really well. We can't get you in. Well, he's not playing well. You know, we got to get him going. It's like, it just makes no sense to me. We're like, let's ice the best lineup that can win hockey games and find a way to win. So I'm hoping they're still in that transition phase of like finding themselves and finding the right chemistry to work. But at the same time, man, we're closing in on April 20th is going to be here soon. And it's time to play the guys that are going to win you hockey games and win this, try to win this team a Stanley Cup. It really is audition time too. I can't, you can't lose track of that. I had Jay Rosso calling me yesterday. Hey, why are they tinkering and changing the lineup after Saturday's game? I said, dude, these games don't matter. Rosie hates it when I say that, but the regular season doesn't matter. Yeah. Specifically these games, they're going to the playoffs. They don't care who they play. They're auditioning. I, I, I'm, I'm waiting for that night where they go 11 and seven. You know, what's going to happen this time last year. We're having that convo. They had nine healthy defensemen. And then they went with 11 and seven, I believe, in the determining game of last season. Um, so it's happening. It's going to come at some point in time. And the the Benoit, you know, situation is just a really unique one for me, where it's like this guy deserves to be in the lineup, especially over at Brody. But I see your point, your point, excuse me, on that front. Uh, the following segment is brought to you by Tim Hortons. Roll up to win is back for Tim's 60th anniversary. And to celebrate their big year, you can win some big prizes like an all electric Volkswagen ID4 a sun-soaked Hilton getaway, and cash with a daily jackpot of $10,000 played today on the Tim's app. So we started with the negative. We'll move to the positive. Uh, Saturday night's game, really, really impressive stuff, at least for 40 minutes. Uh, I wanted to get to the Domi-Matthews combination. These guys have a lot of chemistry, don't they? They do, and uh, it, it's nice to see, right? I, I think his game is really stepped up here. I think Domi is, but he's one of those guys that I, I, I feel like I never really had a lot of doubt with his game moving forward because he's passionate, he cares, he wears it on his sleeve, and and that fight the other night was awesome too as well. He was just absolutely throwing bombs. I, I love the little clip, uh, the tweet you put out about uh, Ty Domi, but these Dude, are guys he, that you want in the playoffs. He, looked he like was, he was one tap right away out. from ending that guy. Like, Yeah, yeah he looked... <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Like the wires look like they were about to cross, man. And like, that is a scary individual. And uh, you see it in his kid when he fights too. Like he doesn't just fight the fight. Like he fights to knock you out. Like he throws bombs. And for a little guy, he's just absolutely wired. So yeah, there it is right there. It's, it's unbelievable. And you can tell like, that is a guy like, do not touch him, man. Like, what are you doing? I, I hope that guy knew him. Cause like, that is a bold move. No, to me, it was like the second tap, like the first tap, like, hey, look, it's your son. Look, Ty, you don't think that's happened to him yeah. before? It's like, hey, your oh son's fighting. How cool is that? But it was the second tap where he looks over and he's like, dude, what the? Watch the lawsuit, Ty. That's all I could think of. Yeah, 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 exactly. No, but it's been great. And I, I think yeah. these guys are adding depth, right? This is what we need. Get to back on topic. That had me fired up there. I was all pumped up there watching Ty trying to get going. But for me, it's yeah. the fact that these guys are getting to go. And I, I like what they have for me. It's always been the back end, right? I think this bottom six, I have faith in Bertuzzi. I have faith in Domi. I have faith in these guys to get well. And I think Bobby McMahon's been a pleasant surprise, oh, right? Man. This is a team that no one expected this. And it's not surprising. He's scoring to me necessarily. Um, because I look at his AHL resume. I looked what he did in with Toronto when I was there with the Marlies, you know, he was built, to, but it's nice to see a guy a little bit older, a little bit more refined. I know Robertson takes a lot of shit, but he is a guy where 
I can see him kind of following this path of maybe, you know, in four years, he becomes that guy. He gets more scoring. He gets a little more well-rounded because it's hard to break in and be in the top six and be that star without the contract, without the status. So I, I like these guys. I like their depth. It's it's just going to be a matter of if the back end can hold up, in my opinion, and which goalie, you know, leads the way. Yeah, I mean, there's so many different routes we can go with that that conversation. Um, the Bob McMahon one, I, I, it's so unique, like where he's at in his career at the age where he's really taken off. And like, this was such an important year. He was a UFA, gets that extension. And again, it's right place, right time. We talked about this uh, two weeks ago with Nick Robertson post deadline. Here's your opportunity. Marner goes down. If you recall, this whole run for Bob McMahon started against the St. Louis Blues, that game where he wasn't supposed to be in the lineup. Then I think Tavares was out, Marner was out, goes out and gets a hat trick, and like the rest is history. I, I love these stories of seizing the opportunity, man. Like Bob McMahon, the thing I noticed with him um, is is the deceiving speed, the size, the release. Like he does a lot of the little things correctly and right, and he plays the game hard, even just looking at the guy like he looks like a hockey player. And then to have a guy like this is like sort of a secret weapon. Again, we love versatility in 2024 when it comes to the NHL game. His ability to play in the bottom six, play on the fourth line, um, be on the top line. Like, I love that aspect of his game. And I think even moving forward, looking forward to next season, you need guys like that on your roster because you have so many big boys to pay. Yeah, no, 100%. You need guys that have value and bring value and are complete hockey players. And for me, it's a fact of... I think there's a little bit of like extra stewing for Bobby McMahon of being an NCAA player and taking time in the minors and learning and having that hockey IQ to grow into your position and not just be like, I score goals. Like I'm a goal scorer, right? Where mm -hmm. it's such a bottleneck I found when I was in the American league and it still is where you get all the best players from everywhere, NCAA, Europe, you know, CHL, and they get there and they're all the best players from where they came from. And a lot of guys have touched on this on shows on, you know, their careers, you have to adapt their, your game. Like you just, you're not going to beat out awesome Matthews. You're not going to beat out William Nylander. These are generational talented players, right? It doesn't mean you aren't a good goal scorer, but it's like the first guy to just alter his game, be smarter, play the right way. You get a little more opportunity. And then when your chance comes and you're ready, you seize the moment and things happen to good people. I, and I found, I had a goalie coach when I was in the minors, Corey Schwab played for a long time, still coaches with Arizona. When I was with San Jose system, he always used to harp on me about being prepared for what I don't know what's coming, right? You have to be able to seize the moment because you don't know when your chance is going to come. You don't know how many chances you're going to get, but man, you get one opportunity. You're not ready. You know, it could fall to the wayside, especially if you aren't a pick, right? If you aren't a draft pick where some of these guys get more chances because, and that's just the way the world works. That's the way the business works. But for a guy like Bobby McMahon, you know, he's earned that right. He earned those opportunities. And when it came, he was ready. And, and it's a good story. And I absolutely love it. Man, Pontus Holmberg is another prime example of that, right? Like, I think if you're Nick Robertson, you look at this roster and look around you, and it's like, man, you started the year as a mainstay. Like, you made the team, um, you know, I, he made the team, right? Or he, did he not? Maybe some people in the chat can correct me. It's been a long season. Maybe he started in the minors, but you got up there with your good showing to start the year, whatever it was in, 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 in the regular season. You got back to the team. You found your footing. But then you look around you and you're like, all these guys are passing me in the depth chart. Like McMahon went from like a month ago to an afterthought. Now he's going to be on the game one roster. I'm starting to get to that point with Pontus Holmberg, man. Like every game when he does something right, he scores a big goal. He sets up a big play, makes a strong defensive play. Pretty much these guys have cemented to Sheldon Keefe that I'm too good to take out of the lineup. And to this point, and again, the conversation is 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 going off right now and boys soul appreciate the response nope he was down uh that's so he started the year in the ahl found his footing got to the nhl but all these guys in the lineup are passing him and i think if you're sheldon keith it is a welcome sight when somebody seizes that opportunity and is like you know what i'm going to be on this team i'm going to be on this roster and you can't tell me otherwise and and to this point it's been consistency that has plagued nick robertson again no i agree and i, I it's one of those facts where I was there when Holmberg came in with the Marlies and the Leafs and a lot of players were like butthurt by it, right? They were like, you know, he came in, got an opportunity where those are the moments where it's like, you need to be reflective on yourself, right? Like there's a reason why you're not playing. There's a reason they don't trust me. They don't want to not play you. Like they're not in the business of losing hockey games. Yes. Opportunities come more to higher end players with bigger contracts with, 
history with, you know, we talk about TJ Brody getting more and more reps where Benoit, but like those are earned extra reps, right? He has earned the right to, to lose the job per se. But for these other guys, younger guys, generation guys, where you're insulated by like, oh, I'm the best, I'm the best, I'm a big draft pick, I should be getting this. Well, no, no, you're not. You have to play. You have to play your way into it. You have to be good on it. And I look at him, it's like, it seems like he comes to work every day, just keeps his nose down, does his thing, doesn't say a lot, does the right things, and has had a big impact, and is earning the right to be a player, an everyday player, and to play in those critical moments where the coach trusts you. There's so much value in that, knowing what you're going to get all the time. And I, and I talk about that a lot. I talk about like Swiss army knife players. Those are the guys coaches love. They're like, okay, Marner's out. You're on the power play. Okay. Oh, we need you on the penalty kill. You can play on the penalty kill. We can do it all. And those are like feathers in your hat. Like that's what you always talk about adding tools to your toolbox as a pro being able to do everything inside that game, but then also being able to show up every day. And if you are scratch, you're not going to bitch about it. You're going to work hard. You're going to find a reason you're accountable. And that's where I find sometimes with the younger generation now is They've been spoon fed their whole career. Sometimes these younger generational players struggle when things become tough, where you need to find a way to battle through. And what can I do to alter my game to be in the lineup to help this team win? What did you see from uh, Ilya Samsonov on Saturday? Obviously, it uh, wasn't ideal. That game was well in hand. And then you put some stress on your goaltender in the third period, ultimately leaves that game in the final minutes. We talked about Martin Jones off the top, how difficult that job is. A, he hasn't played in a while. You're backing up on a Saturday night, feeling good about life. The Oilers in town, you're killing them. And then all of a sudden you're thrust into action and it turned into a bit of a hockey game uh, late in that one. So what'd you see in that situation? And it, it feels like they've dodged a bullet again. You just don't know how to take any comments from Sheldon Keith, but all he said was like, it looks like he's going to be fine. What does that mean? I think he's going to be fine. It didn't look bad to me, like the way he hit, like wrapped around his post on the, on his other knee. I thought Samsonov was good. I thought he played really well. Yeah. It was a tricky game to play. And sometimes you get that big lead and it's like easy, especially playing against a team like that. You saw Colorado did it last night against Pittsburgh down four, nothing with 24 mm -hmm. minutes left and they blow a lead. Like these are offenses that can come back. Like five goals literally isn't a safe lead. That's actually crazy to say about a hockey team. I like his game still. I still think he's been rewarded for that. He's played more. He's steady. He doesn't look as sloppy as he did early in the year. But for me, I think Wall is pushing him. And I and I like the way this is going to play out. I like the idea of just cycling back and forth, getting them going, getting, you know, who's going to be the guy. But for me, it's like I see that injury. I see him leave the game. Even in the morning skate there on the St. Patty's Day game where he oh, left. Yeah. It's like worrisome to me. Like there isn't like that integrity to just like battle and compete. Like if you aren't hurt, like there's – this is professional hockey. You're not going to play. We always would joke around like the first exhibition game of the year is like the first game where you're healthy. You're like, man, I feel really good. And then literally the rest of the year, there's always something going on. So well, it's worrisome for me with Samson off is his resilience come playoff time, come when things aren't going his way, you know, what guy answers the bell. And that's where I think Joseph Wall is going to be his superior when it comes time. Hey, Hutz, you, you can defend your goalie union. Like, I didn't want to say it, man, but it ain't it ain't just a Samsonov thing. These guys drop like flies. Aiden Hill the <laughs> other day. Freddie Anderson was great, but would you be shocked if Freddie Anderson, uh, he's normally allergic to the Stanley Cup playoffs if he doesn't show up for the playoffs or doesn't finish the playoffs for Carolina? Like, this is a growing issue around the league where it's like, guys, I don't know what it is, the taxing, like, you know... I, Marty Brodeur is my always prime example. He was good slated every game. It didn't matter. And all of a sudden, these guys, like they go down and they got shot. Like, I couldn't understand that. It didn't make sense to me. Samsonov went down the way he did. But then after the game, I find out he's fine. Like, which is it? If he's fine, why didn't he finish that hockey game, man? Do you have an answer for me? I know. It, 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 looked, it looks off to me. And I responded to one of your uh, tweets there. I had the guy from uh, Major League. is like, you have no marbles. The, <laughs> the Asian guy on the team. Because it literally, that's what the first thing I saw, man. And I've played with guys like that that are just soft. And I, I went through a stint with Linus where I didn't think he was very resilient. I think he's grown into it. And there, there is a culture thing, possibly. I don't know. But that's the I always... I always had this mindset of like, I never wanted to give up my crease unless I had to, like if I was seriously injured or if it would just wasn't my job. Because I was worried about, you know, you know, losing it, like someone else coming in and playing well and not giving it back. You look at like Bobby McMahon, you look at guys, I don't want to give anyone opportunity. And I remember at times they would come to me and be like, hey, you're tired. Like, can you play or conversations in the American League when I played a lot of games? And I'd be like, no, I'll play. I'll play. I literally have that mindset now doing starting goalies. 
for daily face off. Yeah. And the fact of like, I don't want anyone else to do it. Like we have, I get the weekends off now and I'm kind of like, well, what if this guy doesn't, he does well. Cause that's like my mindset where I feel like sometimes these guys don't have that. And I struggle with that. Cause I think you look at Vasilevsky, he's given up six goals and they're trying to pull him and he's telling the coach to beat Fuck him. No. Like, no, yeah. I'm not. Yeah. I, and I yeah. love that. And that's a winner. And those were, that's what winners do in my opinion. Man, it's a different era though. Again, it gets back to the whole conversation. Like these guys get paid after one strong season in the NHL. Right. And, I think we just grew up in a different era. I was like you, like even, you know, working broadcasting. If I was sick, there's no chance in hell I'm, I'm missing the next broadcast. I mean, you're playing sick right now. You're not missing the show. It's just, it really is. It's so weird to me. Like, wouldn't you want to keep that crease? Why do you want to put any doubt in your future starting the next game? But some of these guys, well, like, it's not just Sammy. Like, they go down like flies. Like, Aiden Hill, that's been the story of his career. I know he wins the cup last year, but he just can't stay healthy. Matt Murray. I mean, there's so many different examples around the league. Like how bad do you want it is my question. No, I agree. And it's one of those ones where it's a five, nothing game. Now it's five, three. You just gave up a, and the goal sucked too, by dry to be honest with you. Like he missed his post. It goes sliding back. Yeah. back. I know it's kind of a whiff play, but like, if he just hits his post, it's a routine save. That one goes in and now all of a sudden you're hurt. It's kind of one of those ones where it's like, you're like on the ground. You're like, Oh man, it went in. Yeah. I'm hurt. Like, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I struggle with it. A I bit. Know. And I feel I feel like he leaves his partner in a tough situation as well, right? We touched on that. Like, now you're just throwing Martin Jones under the bus as well. But he's like a true pro. He's going to go in and do what he has to do. So I hated the situation in general. Yeah. I don't want to be too critical because I don't necessarily know possibly he was hurt. But for me, it, it gave me uh, gave me bad a bad vibe from the beginning. I, maybe because I'm scarred from Sansonoff past too. Yeah, no, dude, it's a sewer job. I, I don't know. Again, it's tough to speculate. You don't know what happened, but are you hurt? Or are you injured? Like the fact that I, I think it hurt more with Sheldon Keith's post game comments saying, looks like he's going to be fine. So is he hurt or did he just leave the game? Because again, he looked like he got shot. Like I thought he was going to the operating room table. And then after the game, like, you know, I was expecting the worst. I'm like, they're saying groin strain. This guy's done for six weeks. And then they come out and say that I was flabbergasted. If that was the case, why didn't he finish the hockey game? You know, and I guess we can just leave that conversation at that, but it's always unique and great when I have a former goalie who played in this league answering that question, because again, it ain't just a Toronto thing. It's around this league. I, you know, I always bring this up on the podcast last year. I know Matt Murray's your boy, but I went to that game with Rosie alumni box. I'm like, I love revenge games. Matt Murray against the Ottawa senators hurt his ankle in, in the pregame warmup was okay enough to back up on the bench, but weirdly enough, just didn't want to play his former team again. And the questions pile up sometimes, but we'll leave that conversation there. Uh, Joel Edmondson, I want to give some love for him on the podcast. I, I thought he was great. He was phenomenal. I love the comments from uh, Domi after the game too. I can't fucking wait to see you in the playoffs, something like that. Like I can't wait to see um, Edmondson play in the postseason, but I, I thought he's been proving his worth the last couple games specifically. No, it's not surprising to me. I, I think when he first got moved here, I spoke pretty highly of him, my time with him in St. Louis and what he brings to the table. And, and there's a guy who's won a Stanley Cup and he was in and out of the lineup. You know, him and Robert Bertuzzo were mm -hmm. six and seven and they took turns kind of being in and out of the lineup as they pushed. Nobody complained. Eddie is a guy that is loved by his teammates and he plays a hard way. He makes it hard. And you look at the runs he's taken at guys, right? Like he's going at McDavid. He's going at Dreisaitl. He is stirring shit up. He's not afraid to... A lot of players don't do that out of respect, right? Where I, I get that, right? There's, you know, these guys are superstars. You don't want to rock the boat. You don't want to be the guy that like blows up Connor McDavid's knee or something or, you know, along those lines. But at the same time, he is trying to set a tone for his teammates, for himself, for the organization, for the fans that like, this is the way I'm going to play. This is the way we are going to play. And players like that drag you into the fight where there's nights where this Leafs team can be leafy. I love to use that Rosie line that he said, cause it stuck with me. It's just like a leafy game, you know, mm -hmm. where he's trying to set a standard of like, this is the way we are going to play and you're going to have to buy into it. And it's going to be hard to play against the Toronto Maple Leafs, especially in our building, right? Like we would always talk on that Barry Trotz head coach of mine would always talk about like in Nashville when, he, when I played for him was like, this is our Coliseum. Like it has to be hard to come in there. It's got to be hard to come into Toronto Maple Leafs into the, Scotia Bank and beat them, right? That you have to take pride in that. And Edmondson is a perfect guy who embodies that and will bring that as the playoffs come. And I think Saturday night is a great example of like, I don't give a shit who we're playing. I'm going to be a rat out here. I'm going to play hard. I'm going to make it hard on everybody. 
And I think he's winning people over and he's winning it over his teammates. And the best part about it is it drags everybody into the mud with him and it makes the, the Toronto Maple Leafs more gritty, which they need. If there's one thing I grasped from my uh, two years working with uh, Gord Selleck, it was um, his fascination with, with, with making Scotiabank Arena a house of pain. And I, I couldn't agree more. I think you look at uh, some of the strong teams, the upper elite teams in the league, like Carolina is a prime example. It is so hard to win in that building. It's so hard to go into that building. You've been in this league. You've gone into bu buildings like that. I just don't get the same feel um, as I do in Toronto. Like I barely go to the games there. I just don't think it's a great environment to watch a hockey game if you support the Leafs or not. I know Rosie was sounding off about that on social media over the weekend. He's so right. It's like, dude, you're fucking pummeling Edmonton on Saturday night and it's a mausoleum in there, which is scary. But nevertheless, uh, this segment brought to you by Charm Diamond Centers. Get custom ring building delivered in less than four weeks with the Charm Masterpiece Program and an unbeatable pricing policy. For more information, go to charmdiamondcenters.com. Uh, special teams has not been great. Uh, what's your level of concern? So in March, the power plays four for 37, 10.8%. The PK is the bigger story, clearly. Uh, they've allowed seven shorties and 35 times short. That's 68.6%. We'll round it up to, uh, to 69. But uh, what have you made of this whole um, conversation? Because it's getting bigger and bigger as we get closer to the Stanley Cup playoffs here. You know, not so worrisome about the power play. I think come playoff time, it's just going to be an absolute battle out there. It's going to be the penalty kill is what you need consistency. You need predictability. And I, I feel like they're going to find it with this. You, you still have some guys that are fairly new to the system that are, you know, bigger bodies that are going to play well on that penalty kill. I like now having, like like I touched on, I think on the back end, the fact that you have Edmondson, you have Labushkin. I think McCabe will be slotted a little bit better. He doesn't have to run around the whole game like a maniac where <laughs> – offensively you know it's just getting in a rhythm getting that confidence going in and these guys are high-end players and i think the power play for them is going to be big opportunities and big moments because the way that this team is structured they need to rely on their offense so i think just simplifying it and i love the way you know we get bertuzzi you get guys going to the front of that creating chaos especially come playoff time that's where the goals are going to be scored and even if you look at like hyman i know hyman plays with mcdavid and you know obviously that helps him but you look at where he scores all his goals. Like the chart of his goals is insane. And I mm -hmm. feel like that's something where this Leafs team needs to prioritize that power play with just getting pucks on net with traffic, creating chaos. It doesn't always have to be pretty. It needs to be simple, consistent. Like there's going to be chances for pretty. It's a read. It's off that. But I find they could get more pucks to the net, which will create that chaos, which will create more opportunity for the for the Stars. Yeah, it's funny. I did a hit in Edmonton over the weekend talking about just that, where it's like, I know Hyman had his struggles in the Stanley Cup playoffs. Again, he's not devoid of the conversation of like Leaf struggles in the postseason when he was a Maple Leaf, but like he is more prone to score that dirty goal, that that rat type goal that you would see from a Bertuzzi or a Domi that you need in the playoffs. Like this tic-tac-toe shit's not going to happen. There's going to be no time and space. It's going to be hard to find that offense. And I think we're going to soon find out if they have the depth and, and the guys and the big boys, can they step up and do it in the right time? And you need that type of offense. And I think you're so bang on when it comes to Hyman. I think simplifying it, uh, the power play is going to figure it out, especially we hope when Mitch Marner comes back, I think everything's going to slot into place, but let's not lose sight of that every year. It seems to be the same conversation and a leading contributor as to why the least fall short in the postseason. the power play widely regarded as a top five PP in the entire league in the regular season runs dry the offense runs dry so very very curious about that uh the pk i think speaks for itself i mean you're going to put the clamps down defensively i think over the last five to seven games and 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 connor dewar is a guy that they brought in from minnesota i think struggling to find his footing thus far on the fourth line but i think the way they're deploying him tells me they think dewar is going to be in there for game one of the postseason they think he's a guy he's a roster mainstay yeah, it seems that way, like especially what he's done. And, and he's a solid player. You know, you kind of know what you're going to get. I, I feel like at times we're critical of players. Like we think they're just going to step in the lineup and like just blow the doors off. There's guys yeah. that just play certain roles. And that's why you need players of of depth and of, of simplicity at times because you already have such a high-end talent up front that are going to get you the goals, get you offense. So I think he's slotted well and he's played well as of to this point, but I, I still feel like there's still a little bit of battle internal battle here for who is going to be in that opening night roster. And for me, the one obviously that, you know, in net is obviously the big one. And yeah. 
on the back end, I think it Benoit needs to be in there, but it's interesting to see how they've handled this. So this depth wise, it's it's they have the depth, I feel like fairly confident. But like when I start to look at other teams' rosters, they are gonna be in tough and they're gonna have to find a way to really, really pull it together here come playoff time. It's time for the Great Clips Inbox question of the day with more than 4,400 hair salons throughout the United States and Canada. In fact, I went to Great Clips to get this haircut over the weekend. The world's largest hair salon brand and official hair salon of the NHL. Salons are locally owned and operated and open seven days a week. Your time is valuable. Use the Great Clips check-in app. See the wait time. Check in on your phone and get your haircut when you want. This from Boys Soul. What is the mentality slash preparation for sitting on your ass for 56 minutes referring to Martin Jones, then getting the tap on the shoulder to go face McDavid while down a man. You know, you'd honestly think it's worse than it is, right? I feel <laughs> like just uh, adrenaline takes over a little bit, right? You get like pumped up and you're ready to rock. It's almost easier sometimes just when the injury happens and you like go in where sometimes when they pull the guy and then you got to sit all in the intermission and you're like trying to get ready or like, how do I get ready? Where you just jump over the wall and it's something you've done thousands upon thousands and thousands of times is go in there and pull. And he's the perfect guy for it because he's simple. He doesn't really beat himself. And, uh, you know, good on him, right? It, it's a tough situation to go into because I'm sure if he would have went in and gave up two and they lost in overtime, everyone would have been, oh, got to get rid of him. He sucks, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's a tough spot, but it's a cross you bear being a goalie. And, uh, you know, he did a hell of a job doing it. The Botano Wrap-Up is presented by Botano.ca. The game starts now, 19+. plus. Please play responsibly. Major announcement, Botano is the official partner of Copa America 2024, taking the beautiful game to new heights in the Americas. Join Botano on their journey of passion, unity, and unforgettable football moments. Anything you like over the next couple of days? I know we got some big-time games for Vegas the next couple of nights. Uh, your former team, the Nashville Predators, man, 16-0-2 in the last 18, I think it is, something around that, Dave. They've been incredible, um, but uh, I'm looking at that one specifically tonight. Vegas into St. Louis, a big swing in momentum and points potentially in that one. Yeah, that's a huge game here. And, uh, you know, they obviously snuck away with one, I think, in that Minnesota game. St. Louis knocking off Minnesota in overtime, which, you know, blowing that lead late. So this is going to be a huge game. And and for me, it's weird Vegas sitting in that standpoint. I feel like they need to flex a little muscle here because I don't think no one thought they would be sitting here as the – especially what they added, you know – they went out and added a bunch of players at the deadline sitting here in the second wild card spot. But for me, it's going to be interesting to see what this Canucks team does tonight. I think this is a big divisional matchup and I like the Kings here on the road. I know Vancouver is a juggernaut. I love their game, but I think this is going to be a big test game and it's going to be a good measuring stick for the Kings. And I think without Thatcher Demko, it'll be a big matchup here for the Canucks. I'll uh, ride with you on that one, man. Great job today, bud. No problem. Thanks for having me, buddy. I always like getting the call up and congrats on the new do. I need a haircut soon too. I had to go with a hat today, but oh, uh, maybe baby. I'll swing by great clips later on here. Love that. Great promo as well. Um, speaking of promos coming up on tomorrow's show, Jay Rose Hill back in the mix. We're going to tee up the uh, Leafs and Devils. Weird scheduling note too. I think they got 12 games left. Three are against the New Jersey Devils. They're playing their entire season series over the span of uh, the last 12 games of the season. We'll see, we'll see the Devils coming up on Tuesday. Uh, speaking of which, Brian Boyle, former Toronto Maple Leaf, I believe former Devil as well, will pop by for a conversation now with the NHL Network as an analyst. So thank you to everybody in the chat at the Leafs Nation 401. Very local and vocal, I should say, for a Monday here in the chat. So appreciate you all at the Leafs Nation 401. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that like button. Many thanks to producer Vic. And of course, uh, for Carter Hutton, I'm Nick Alberga. We'll talk tomorrow. Make sure to check out more of our content right here on the Leafs Nation YouTube page. We got long form interviews, we got clips, you got epic rants by Jay Rozo. We simply have it all. And don't forget, you can find out much more at theleafsnation.com. Thanks so much for watching.